This is the Red Sox clubhouse. What memories are here of the dream and the team who held our hearts through an unforgettable year? Here, the still mementos of the team and the campaign. A telegram, an airline stub, a spot of dried champagne. Truly an unsinkable team. Indeed, an impossible season. Why have we come back now? The heart must have its reason. This place holds echoes of that team and the fans who came to cheer them. And as we stand here, listen now. It seems that we can hear them. The pitch is looped towards shortstop. Petroselli's back. He's got it. The Red Sox win. And it's pandemonium on the field. Ken Coleman speaking to you from the happiest place in America today, the Red Sox dressing room at Fenway Park, where everyone has just finished listening to the ball game and the ball players outside are really excited and very happy as you can well imagine. As the Boston Red Sox have won the 1967 American League pennant. And here with us is the man who put this team together. The Vice President and General Manager of the Red Sox, Dick O'Connell. And Dick, I know this is going to be a great day for you. Ken, this is a very happy day. It's a very happy day for everybody here. All these ball players are out here screeching, cheering, hugging each other. This is one of the greatest days the Red Sox have faced for years and years and years. And Dick Williams is so happy. I'm so proud that he is happy. He's done such a great job around this ball club. for thick and thin and making moves that nobody dare move, playing different kind of baseball for Fenway Park. It's sure great. It's sure great to be here. Every dream has its builder, and Dick O'Connell was the principal architect of this one. In December, four months before the first ball was thrown, it was O'Connell who told us what to expect. Uh, we don't say wait till next year anymore. This was the year which we passed over. Everything we did this year, the trades we made, the ball players we put in the field was to play for 1967 and 68. Another member of the team behind the team, Director of Player Personnel Haywood Sullivan, spent his season on the telephone talking trades, checking scouting reports. So on the October Sunday, when his efforts paid off in a pennant, it seemed strangely appropriate that Sully was on the phone again. It's just the happiest day of my life, I know. One of, the, one of the many happy days of my life, and I'm just proud of everybody who had a part in this. Everybody, including the fans, the players, everybody in the whole organization. It's just a wonderful day for especially Mr. Yorkie. When he took over as manager, Dick Williams made a promise. The only thing I can tell you right now, I'll guarantee you we'll have a hustling ball club, and uh, they won't quit. They didn't quit on me in Toronto. I don't intend to have anybody quit on me here. And the young leader also made a prediction. I honestly think we'll win more ballgames than we lose. The Williams team included a man who spent 30 years on that long bus ride, which is how they travel the minor league trail. Coach Eddie Popowski. And on that fantastic final day, the day when the 100 to 1 long shot paid off, as always, Eddie Popowski had the words to fit the occasion. This is a hell of a day, isn't it? <laughs> Pop coached at third. In the first base coach's box stood a familiar Fenway Park figure. Those whose memories stretch over the 21 years to the last pennant remember the unofficial captain of that 1946 team, and they will tell you what a thrill it was to see Pesky, Williams, DiMaggio, York, and the others charge out of the dugout, led by Bobby Doerr. Ken, this is fantastic. This is something that... Uh... Yeah, it's just hard to explain the feeling that there is here. I, I was sure we were going to have a playoff some way. I couldn't see how four clubs could be in there up the last two or three days and three up to the last day and not have a playoff. And uh, now we win it, and uh, these fellows are fantastic. I, it's a great thrill for me. A thrilling climax to an amazing season. If ever there was an example of teamwork, this was it. And Dick Williams said so. My players have been fabulous. They have been terrific all year long. The front office has been great. They've been out of this world. I'm here just listening and sweating like you are. And it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of 25 men. And I, I'd like to thank God. 
Yes, cheers and congratulations for, if you want the truth, some of the most rabid fans of all sit in the broadcast booth. It is, if I may add, a personal note. As a broadcaster who's been in this thing for 20 years and has been fortunate enough to have been around some great championship teams, the greatest thrill of my life. And from Fenway Park, this is Ken Coleman returning you to our studios. When you come to call the honor roll, you ponder where to start. Each man made his contribution. Each man played his part. The man who served as leader in the field and at the plate with his glove and hustle with his bat and muscle was the fabulous number eight. Here's the windup and the pitch. Here's a drive going deep to right field, and it is tied up. Carl Yastrzemski has tied it up in the ninth inning with a home run. Into the upper deck in right field, it is five to five. The pitch to Smith. High top fly back into shallow center field. Coming in is Stroud and making the catch is the second baseman. Here comes Yaz to the plate. He's safe. Yaz hit deep toward left center field. Way back goes Howard. He won't be able to get that one. It is gone. Home run number 37 for Carl Yastrzemski. Driving in runs number 98, 99, and 100 on the year. And here he comes, number eight. He was uh, asked if he wanted to take a rest tonight, and he said no. Through the exciting season, he carried us along. The bleachers and the left field wall echoed with the song. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz. We love him. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski. What boy he has, our Boston team is always on the beam, cause we got Yaz. We Fenway fans, we stop and clap our hands at Yaz's yes, Jazz. Those rival pitchers on the mound all shake. They dread each windup that they have to take. When number eight is standing at the plate, and then he swings. It's one off the wall, and there's Yastrzemski going for the ball. They try for two, the runner knows he's through. Ah, look at Yaz, whoa, he threw him out again. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, he's the idol of Boston Mass on Beacon Hill. Quite a thrill. In Southie, too, there's lots of whoop they do in the North End. They call Carl Friend, and they hope the season will never end. From Wellesley Way, they come to watch him play, and on Cape Cod, they take a holiday from all about. They come to shout, yell for years to hit one out, the state of Maine. It's going quite insane in Vermont. It's only Yaz they want from every state. They come and wait to see Yastrzemski at home plate. Our Boston team, it's always on the beam, cause we got Yaz. We Fenway fans, we stomp and clap our hands at Yaz's jazz. Although Yastrzemski is a lengthy name, it fits quite nicely in our Hall of Fame. We love him so in Boston, we all know that when he swings, yeah, 
Here we go again. The center fielder, rookie Reggie Smith, started the season at second base. But when the injured Mike Andrews returned to the lineup, Reggie returned to center field. And it may be many seasons before anyone is able to move him out of there again. There's a well-hit ball to center field. Back goes Reggie, still going back. Reaches up. He's got it. Reggie digging in. His slightly open stance from the right side. Holds the bat high. Here's Burnett's delivery. High fly ball to left field. Very deep. Weichardt is watching this one. It is gone. Home run. And in right field, Tony Canigliaro. Canigliaro hits a fly ball. Deep toward left field. Weichardt going back toward the wall. It is off the wall. Tony around first going for two. The throw to second is not in time. He slides in with a double. When Tony was hit by a pitch and the doctors announced he was through for the season, it seemed the unsinkable team had been sunk. With 45 games to go, manager Williams looked to his bench, and the call did not go unanswered. That Sunday in Chicago, a vital game, and Jose Tartable made what has been called the play of the year. Josephson, a right-handed batter. Barry, a fast man at third. Wyatt looks in at him and throws. And there is a little blooper to right field. Tartable coming on, has a weak arm. Here comes a throw to the plate. It is out at home. He is out. Tartable has thrown the runner out at the plate. And the ball game is over. And it was the bench which provided the punch in many of the victories which earned for this team the nickname of Cardiac Kids. Norm Seaburn. Waste no time as he wraps the ground single in the hole between first and second, scoring Petroselli with the go-ahead run. Dalton Jones will come up to bat for Mike Andrews. His average at 248, and of late, he has been getting the job done consistently in the tough role of pinch hitting. Tega with a 3-2 pitch. Line deep in the right field. Over goes the right fielder. Top the wall. One run is in. Here comes Rico with a second. Dalton Jones is going in with a standing triple. The veterans and the youngsters, like the infield's peerless pair, the kid and the quiet man, Andrews and Adair. Mike Roll Andrews. Off, ready, and the pitch. Bunted toward third. Here comes Smith. Hell feels the ball. No play, and it's scores tied. The pitch to Mike. Fly ball to left field deep, and this one is gone for a home run. A ground ball to second. Charged by Andrews. Tags the runner. Throws to first. Double play. And Jerry Adair, a 10-year veteran who joined the team in June. The trade which brought him from Chicago serves as another example of how the front office team backed up the team on the field. Bell looks back towards second, throws, fastball, hit on the ground, past the mound, backhanded by Adair, throws to first. He's got him on a good play. And Jerry is being led off. Spiked on the play. And getting a big hand as he comes toward the dugout. The quiet man from Oklahoma will be replaced by Mike Andrews. And Andrews comes out and takes his glasses as Jerry Adair leaves the game. Jerry Adair is here with us now, and we've referred to him often as Mr. Clutch during the course of the season. And Jerry, congratulations on another great job today. Thank you very much, Ken. This is uh, undoubtedly the happiest day of my life. Later in the season, another veteran was added to the roster in a deal with the Yankees. Elston Howard joined the team. He already had played a role in the Red Sox story. The crowd roars at Yankee Stadium. Three runs on eight hits for Boston. No runs on no hits for New York. And the man now is Elston Howard. Line drive into right field for a base hit. Howard changed uniforms and changed roles. The man who had broken our hearts in April lifted them in September. So here we are. The bases are loaded. There is one out. We're in the last of the ninth inning, and Elston Howard is up. Left-hander into his windup. The pitch to Elston. Fly ball into left center field. Base hit. Red Sox win it. 
The other catchers, Mike Ryan from Haverhill, Russ Gibson from Fall River, did their part. For Gibson, it was the end of a decade of drudgery, ten years in the minor leagues. And then there was the kid at shortstop, Rico Petroselli. Curveball, the line toward left field, maybe trouble, bounces on one hop toward the wall. Tresh has it, fires toward second. Here comes Rico, slides in, he's got a double. And when it came to that final out of that final game, Rico was there, waiting. The pitch is looped toward shortstop. Petroselli's back, he's got it. The Red Sox win. And it's pandemonium on the field. As a rookie, he was a slugger. This year, he became a hitter. But one thing George Scott never was, he never was a quitter. Ground ball, great stop by Scott, and he tags the bag. A tremendous play by the Red Sox first baseman on a rifle shot. Ground ball right over the bag. Line drive into deep right center field. And this one is hitting off the wall. Canigliaro around third base and in to score. Scott going for a triple. Cannot throw is not in time. And Joe Foy, he started a sparkling triple play. He hit a grand slam home run. And Joe Foy was the first to admit being there was twice the fun. Thank you. It's great. And we won the pen. How about that? <laughs> when the pitching faltered, more often than not, the pressure-packed task of saving the game fell to one of two men. We're going to get some action now out on the bullpen as John Wyatt and Sparky Lyle start warming up. Yes, Wyatt and Lyle. Another combination of the veteran and the rookie. And Gary Bell, who came from Cleveland to help. And Lee Stang. And Daryl Brandon. And Dan Osinski. And Bill Landis. And Bill Rohr. And Dave Moorhead and Jerry Stevenson. And Gary Wozlewski, who made the trip from eight years in the minors all the way to a World Series start. And this man. The set by Santiago. Here it comes. And a strike three. The ball game is over. Jose Santiago strikes out Rich Reese and saves it for Johnny Wyatt. And the Red Sox come from behind to win the first game of this Twinighter. On those long winter nights when the New England wind blows exceedingly cold, old-timers sit and spin the tales of the Red Sox teams of old. Some will talk of Smokey Joe Wood or of Houston's fastball serves. Others will tell of Ferris, Parnell, and Kinder's jug handle curves. They'll mix fiction with truth as they talk about Ruth and how Grove made him hit on the ground. Then we'll tell of this year and the way we would cheer when Lonborg was out on the mound. And all around Lonborg as he heads back in, his teammates are there to congratulate him. Dick Williams, Eddie Popowski, Elston Howard, and the fans here in New York, you'd think you're in Boston. On to the World Series. Lonborg wins games two and five. He dazzles the Cardinals' batters. His fastball is alive. The Cardinals of St. Louis, with their Gibsons, Floods, and Brocks, are held to a six-game standoff by the scrappy, hustling Sox. And then the wary Lonborg tries to answer his team's call. He gave it his best, but with two days' rest, he never stood so tall. And those Sox followers saddened as each Cardinal tally crossed. One sports writer called it the series nobody lost. The fans, they came in record numbers to fill the Fenway stands and screamed with record volume to make known their demands. As they yelled and hollered for their beloved Sox, the greatest fan of them all watched from a rooftop box. Really, all I can say is really the most terrific thrill I've ever had. I don't see how anything could get that. But other than that, I don't have words that can describe my feeling. Or it's just a terrific, fantastic thing. Thomas Austin Yockey, owner, sportsman, fan. Baseball lives in Boston. 
through the efforts of this man. For Boston is a tradition town with a history to uphold. And when Bostonians remember, this story will be told. Proudly fathers will tell their sons of this year and this team how by courage and grit and refusing to quit, they forged our impossible dreams. (laughs) 